Yes, sir. All right, all right, Crave Weekend. Let's go. Come on, y'all got to get excited about that video. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Church, I just got to tell you, it has been a phenomenal weekend here among these students. We have seen God at work in incredible ways. I wish every single one of you could have been with us last night in this room, watching students just going for it in worship, hearing students pray over one another, seeing steps of faith taken as students literally had bold and courageous faith in front of all of their peers to stand up and walk down here and say, I'm following Jesus. It has been an amazing weekend. Amazing weekend. Yeah, you can clap for that. And students, I just want to say to each and every one of you, we are so, so grateful that you made the decision to spend a weekend like this here at Shades. I want you to hear me say this. We love you. We believe in you. We see God at work in you. You are not the future of the church. You are the church. God has big things in store for you. He wants to use your life for his glory. Do not miss out on the significance of that. God is at work among you. There is a church right here that that supports you, has been praying for you, has been lifting you up. We've had a group of 33 men in our church this weekend. We call them our deacons. They have been praying for every single one of you by name. We love you guys. We believe in you, and we want you to know how incredible it is to walk with Jesus through this life. So do not lose sight of what has happened here this weekend. I know, I know that Monday is coming. It's going to hit different. Do not lose sight of what God has done in your life this weekend. Megan and I had the privilege of of being one of the host homes. And so we had 20 10th grade girls staying in our house all weekend. Where are our 10th grade girls? Because y'all, yeah, there we go, right there, back there. Yeah, y'all can be more excited, but you know, I understand you're tired. I'm tired. I cannot wait for a Holy Spirit-inspired divine nap this afternoon. It's going to be amazing. And I know many leaders and host homes, you feel the same way, and we cannot thank you enough for opening your homes. Leaders, we can't thank you enough for laying it on the line for these students, for loving them, for caring for them, for pointing them to the truth of what Jesus Christ has done. It has been an amazing, amazing weekend. What I want to do now is I want to turn your attention to the Word of God in the book of Colossians. That's where we've been spending time all Crave Weekend, church. We've we've been in Colossians. We had an unbelievable preacher here with us on Thursday and Saturday. Recap. Can y'all give it up for recap, students? Oh, man. He was incredible, and he walked us through Colossians 1 and 2, and and in the small groups that the students have been doing, they've been walking through the book of Colossians, and so it's my privilege this morning to step into the book of Colossians and to preach from Colossians chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it. Go ahead and turn with me to Colossians 3. If you don't have a, a Bible with you today, there are Bibles all around the room in the backs of the seats. We would encourage you to grab one of those so that you can and see for yourself what the Word of God is saying as we walk through this time together. And what we do each week at Shades, when we, when we turn to the Word of God in, in a message on Sunday, we stand at the beginning of the message for the reading of God's Word. And so I want to invite you to do that now, if you're willing and able. Stand with me as I read Colossians chapter 3. And if you're new to Shades, the reason we do this each week is we want to be reminded that the church of Jesus Christ stands on the word of God. The inerrant, unchangeable word of God is the firm foundation under our feet. And every time we, we turn our attention to the divinely inspired word of God, we are turning our attention to what God says is right and good and true. This is what we need to hear. Listen to the word of the Lord in Colossians 3, beginning in verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, 
Seek the things that are above. Somebody say above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The scripture goes on to say, set your mind on things that are above. Somebody say above. Not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for us that God would speak into our lives during this time. And then we will be seated together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege that it is to celebrate a weekend like this. Father, we thank you for the the gift that you have provided in the lives of so many students, showing them your love and your grace in a very real way. And Father, it is a privilege now as a church to come alongside these students, to join into what you're doing, and to turn our attention to your holy word. And Father, we believe what your scripture says, that this word is living and it is active. And that means right now as we turn our attention to your word, there is something that you want to do among us. There is something you want to do in us. And so I pray that your word would be alive in us today, that we would see what you know we need to see, that that our eyes would be open and our hearts would be receptive, and Lord, that we would not be the same as a result of that which you say. We pray that you would be glorified through it all. Thank you for this time. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing with me. This sermon has a very simple title, a very basic title, two words that I believe can absolutely change your life. The two words are this, look up, look up. In fact, why don't you do this right now? Turn to somebody beside you, just point your finger up in the sky and say to your neighbor, look up, look up, look up. Verse one tells us to look up, seek the things that are above. Verse two tells us to look up, set your mind on the things that are above. Look up. Why do we need to hear that? Because most of the time we look down. Most of the time we look down. We're looking at what's directly in front of us. We're looking at what's on our screen or our device. Most of the time, our thoughts and our attention are are completely focused, fixated, and consumed by the things that are right in front of us. And the things that are right in front of us, they they can very quickly become overwhelming. The things that are right in front of us can very quickly become all-consuming. The things that are right in front of us can very quickly become frustrating. The things that are right in front of us can very quickly create stress and worry and fear. And so the Word of God reminds us, if you are in Christ... There is a lens through which you're supposed to see your life and your circumstances and your world. And the way that you find that lens to view the world, if you are in Christ, is when you look up. Look up. Look up and be reminded of who our God is. Look up and be reminded of what our God has done. I want to walk through these verses and I want to draw your attention to three things that begin to happen When we make an intentional decision to consistently look up. Three things that begin to take place in our life when we have a growing awareness of the things that are above. Look back at Colossians 3 verse 1. We see this, look up and be in awe. That's the first thing I want to draw your attention to. Look up and be in awe. The scripture says it this way, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right 
hand of God. If then you have been raised with Christ. What, what is Paul saying here to the church in Colossae and to, to the church today as the Holy Spirit continues to use this inspired word to speak life and truth to those who turn to the scripture? What is Paul saying? He is saying, if you are in Christ, you have been raised. Your old life, it is gone. It is dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, the scripture says. But because of what Christ has done through, through his sacrificial death at the cross, he has, he has made a way for you to be forgiven of your sins, covered in the grace of God, called a child of God, a new creation, lifted up, raised up out of the grave through the power of the resurrected Savior. If you are in Christ, you have been raised with Christ. And as a result of being raised with Christ, you are to have a new vision, a new perspective, a new lens through which you see the world. Look up and be in awe of what the Savior has done. The one who is seated on the throne, reigning and ruling over all, the one who is sovereign, he sees you. He knows you. He pursues you with his love. He invites you to, to, to be a part of his family, to be called a child of God. He is offering you forgiveness and grace and mercy and compassion and kindness. He is drawing you into his love and his grace. Be in awe of the one who is seated on the throne, reigning over all is calling you by name. Look up and be in awe. And here's the thing that begins to happen when we actually have an awe uh, of something that is greater, more powerful, more awesome than we are. When we begin to see something that is, that is more, more, more powerful than we can even comprehend. When we begin to see something that is, that is more awesome than we even have words to describe. When all begins to grow in our heart and our mind. Here's what happens. We actually begin to feel small. If you have a growing sense of all, you will have a growing sense of being small. Why is that the case? Well, certainly when you are around something, aware of something that is so much greater than yourself, there is no way that you can puff yourself up. It is a perspective check. It puts things in their proper place. It gives us a vision to realize, hey, hey there is one that is so much greater than me. Let me see if I can give you a little example of this. A few years back, I had this incredible opportunity and amazing privilege to go and preach at the chapel service for the Atlanta Falcons, the professional football team in Atlanta. And they, they were playing the Pittsburgh Steelers on this specific weekend. And, and, and I found out as I got the information about this service that the chapel service was actually going to happen on Saturday night, the night before the game. The team gathers at a team hotel in Atlanta and they have meetings with all their different positions going over all of their assignments for the next day. And then they have a chapel service for whoever wants to come from the team to that service. I was excited, but I can tell you I was very intimidated walking in to this room for this service. And, and, and as I was in the room waiting and the players started to, to walk in to the room, the first player that walked in to the service was a guy named Jake Matthews. He still plays for the Falcons. He's number 70 on the offensive line. Jake Matthews is 6'5". He weighs 310, 320 pounds. He's an all-pro offensive lineman. He is massive. And he reached out and he wanted to shake my hand. And so I reach out and my hand completely disappeared <laughs> in this massive mitt of a hand. And then some other guys came in who were also offensive linemen 
Over 300 pounds, massive dudes, these incredible professional athletes who are ridiculously large and ridiculously athletic at the same time. And all the offensive linemen that were in the chapel service, they sat on the front row. I mean, it's kind of like right now with, with you ladies. I mean, no, it's very different, very different. They were massive. These guys were huge. And here's the thing. When I'm looking at these incredible offensive linemen standing in front of me that are so big and so powerful and so strong, I'll just go ahead and tell you, um, my first illustration in my message was not about the days when I played high school football. I played a little high school football. In fact, believe it or not, I actually played a little bit of offensive line. It's about 25 pounds heavier back then. But I can assure you, as I'm looking at real football players, massive men, I have no desire to talk about my little dinky experience of playing high school football. Because you can't act like you're big and bad and powerful when you're in the presence of someone who's actually big and bad and powerful. And here's the deal. When we truly are in awe of the one who is sovereign and reigning over all, that he knows our name, that he calls us by name, that he loves us, that he has sent his son to die on a cross for our sin, to be resurrected from the grave so that our sin could be defeated once and for all, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father on high, reigning over all. When our minds can begin to comprehend this incredible good news, and we begin to grow in awe of who he is and what he has done, we begin to feel small. And rightly so. Because it reveals how much we need him. It reveals how incredible and awesome he truly is. I love this quote from Dr. Paul Tripp. He writes this about an awe of God. He says, awe of God will make you feel small, and that is good because that is what you and I are. Awe of God will make you feel unworthy for the task. It will confront you with healthy inability. And not only does that sense produce a trust in God's wisdom, power, and grace, it also makes you humble, approachable, patient, kind, passionate, and willing. When you are blown away by the glory of the Savior and his cross, you will be driven to that cross for the character and strength you need to represent the Savior well in the lives of those around you. You will be quick to admit your need. You will be obsessed not by how much people respect you, but by how much they worship their Redeemer. All of God puts you in your place and it will keep you there. Students, I believe many of you this weekend had an opportunity to be in awe of God. What you have seen, what you have heard, what you have experienced, it has been an opportunity to look up, to be reminded of, of who God is and what he has done for you. May you live in awe of the one who reigns and pursues you with his love. I love the way King David writes it in Psalm chapter eight. He says this in Psalm eight, he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How awesome is your name. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babies and infants. You have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. And then listen to this. This is so profound and so powerful. David says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. David says, when I look up 
And when I am reminded of the creator God who is sovereign and reigning over all the universe, who who holds the moon and the stars in the palm of his hand, and then I consider that the God who is sovereign and reigning over all the universe is actually mindful of me, He actually knows my story. He actually cares about me. He's actually compassionate and kind towards me. I'm absolutely amazed. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. David says, I am in awe. The God who is reigning over all knows me and loves me. Students, Parents, church, when someone is in awe of God, it begins to show up. It begins to show up in the way they talk about situations in their life. It begins to show up in the way they talk about things that are happening in the world around them. May you look up and may you be in awe of who God is and what he has done. Let's go back to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verses two and three. Here we see that as you begin to look up, as you look up, you will watch the things of this world fade. This is so incredible to consider. Colossians 3, verses two and three. The Apostle Paul writes this, set your mind on things that are above. Look up, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I was thinking about this week, uh, if we were to go around the room and and do a thought audit of each and every one of us to, to, to line out, line by line, detail by detail, every thought that we have had this week, it would probably be staggering how much of our mind's attention, how much of our thoughts have been consumed, maybe even obsessed with the things of this world. How much of your mind's attention is is consumed and obsessed with the things of this world? The scripture says, set your mind on things above. Look up. Don't just be fixated and focus on the things that are on earth. Because if you are, you will very quickly be overwhelmed. And if you are, you will very quickly begin to retreat. And if you are, focus on the things that are on earth. You will very quickly begin to wander away from God's best for your life and God's purpose for you. Set your mind on things that are above, and as you look up, you will begin to see the things of this world start to fade. They lose their power. They lose their grip because you are reminded that this world, this life is not all there is. One of my favorite songs of the church It's an old hymn that's just over 100 years old. It's called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I love this song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It it was written in the 1920s by a a woman, a songwriter named Helen Lemmel. And the reason she wrote this song that the church now sings today, still over 100 years uh, from when it was written, is because Helen Lemmel was actually inspired by by the life of uh, of a missionary named Lelias Trotter. We've got a picture of Lelias Trotter. Lelias Trotter had this very interesting story. She Uh, grew up in London, England, and she was from a very wealthy and prestigious family. And and at a very young age, it became very obvious that that Lelias was a very gifted artist. In fact, art critics at the time in the early 1900s began to see some of her work, and they said she, she had the potential to become one of the greatest artists of her generation. Incredibly talented, incredibly gifted. 
But at a very early age, Elias Trotter's family, even in all of their, their wealth and their influence in London, they, they began to take her to serve among the poor in inner city London. And God began to do a work in her heart. And as she got a little bit older and was thinking about career and thinking about her life's purpose and thinking about what she was going to do with, with what God had done in her life, she began to feel this tug and this call and this pull to the mission field. And so instead of pursuing this career in art that could have brought her all of this fame and, and could have increased her family's fortune, Elias Trotter felt God's calling on her life to go to Africa and to serve among unreached peoples in relative obscurity. For 40 years, she served in Africa as a missionary. For 40 years, she was relatively unknown. But she continued to do art, and she continued to write. And one of the poems that she wrote as a missionary in Africa somehow got shared with the songwriter Helen Limmel. And Helen Limmel was so inspired by the story that she heard of Elias Trotter's life that she sat down and she wrote this song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, that says this, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Listen to this. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The things of earth will grow strangely dim. Now, I just want to ask you here this morning. Are the things of this earth growing strangely dim in your life, in your thoughts? Or are the things of this earth growing normally clear? Because for most people, the things of this earth, it's just normal for them to be clear, for them to be the desire, for them to be the want, for them to be the focus, for them to be where all of the tension goes. Are the things of this earth growing strangely dim because you look up and you see that this life is not all there is? Or are the things of this earth just normal and clear to you because all of your focus is right here on things that ultimately will rust and fade away and be destroyed? The word of God says, set your mind on things that are above, not on the earth. Look up and see what Christ has done. Look up. See the power of living for eternity. Look up and watch the things of this world begin to fade. We say it this way often here at Shades. Leverage your life for the sake of the gospel. Look up and realize that all that you have been given has been given to you as a gift to be used to point to eternity and the one who gave you those gifts to begin with. Look up and leverage your life for the sake of the gospel wherever you are and wherever God takes you. Look up and live for the things that will actually last. And then finally, we see, excuse me, I, there actually there was a quote I wanted to share, and I really love this quote. This is from C.S. Lewis. We're going to put this up on the screen. In thinking about a life that is devoted to looking up, Lewis famously wrote many, many years ago, if you read history, if you read history, you will find that Christians who did the most for this present world were just those who thought the most of the next. Christians who did the most for this present world were just those who thought the most of the next. That's an amazing thing to consider. Do you want your life to make an impact? 
Do you want your life to count? Do you want your life to matter? If you do, fix your eyes on what is eternal and live for what will actually last. Look up. and Watch the things of this world fade as you focus on eternity and what God has done. Colossians 3, 4, our final verse for today, encourages us to look up and live with hope. The verse says this, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Look up and see the glorious hope of the gospel. Oh, how we need to hear this, church. Do not miss this, church. As you look out at the world around you today, tomorrow, the next day, there are so many reasons to look out and conclude there's no hope. There are so many reasons to look at the brokenness of this world, to see so many who are living in darkness, to see so many who are living in hopelessness and go, okay, I just, I need to be consumed with fear. I need to be consumed with worry. All these things are swirling in the world around me. All these things are happening in my personal story. It is so easy to conclude that it's all hopeless. And when you are focused only on the things of this world, you will very quickly lose hope. But church, listen, are you listening? Do not miss this. Church, it is when things grow the darkest around us that the light of the gospel shines the brightest. It is when the world around us grows dark, that the church of Jesus Christ has the greatest opportunity to point to the hope that we have because we are not a people who are without hope. Church, don't miss this. As the world around you is more and more broken and your feed reminds you moment by moment of all the darkness in the world around us, We have an opportunity to shine the light of hope that will never go out. This verse is so powerful. We've been given the promised hope that declares when Christ appears, all who are in Christ will be with him in glory. All who are in Christ will be with him forevermore. Look up and live with hope. For you have a hope that does not disappoint. I want to close very quickly by turning your attention to 1 Thessalonians. Go go a few pages over to 1 Thessalonians from Colossians. Another letter written by the Apostle Paul, divinely inspired to encourage and challenge the church of Jesus Christ. And as he writes this letter to the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 4, he points us to the hope that we have for all of eternity. Listen to the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we always will be with the Lord. Last night, students, we talked about hang time. We will be caught up in the air and will always be with the Lord. Therefore, the scripture says, encourage one another with these words. Church, be encouraged. If you are in Christ, there will never be a time. There will never be a time when you are separated from the Lord. If you are in Christ, Whether your life ends tomorrow 
or whether you are here when Christ returns, because Christ is returning. He is coming again. Regardless, if you are in Christ, you will always be with the Lord, which means you always have hope. So encourage one another. Remind one another. When your brothers and your sisters get, get frustrated or overwhelmed, when, when your brothers and your sisters are, are seeing all the news feeds that are completely consumed with the things of this earth and, and feel like darkness is winning, say, no, in Christ we have a hope. In Christ we will always be with the Lord. So look up, fix your eyes on Jesus. Look up and gaze on his beautiful, wonderful face. Look up and be in awe of who he is and what he has done. Look up and watch the things of this world begin to fade. Look up and live with hope. For what the world so desperately needs is what the church of Jesus Christ can so readily provide. We are a people who always have hope. So church, look up. Focus your eyes on Jesus and live with the hope of the gospel that the world so desperately needs to hear. Let me pray for us as we close. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for this incredible opportunity to turn our attention to your word as a church, to see what you're doing among so many different generations at the same time here at Shades. It's an incredible blessing to behold. We praise your name. We praise your name. And Lord, this weekend... There's a big group of students that have been reminded to look up. And tomorrow, they're gonna go back to reality. And I pray that as they step back into reality, they will have a growing awareness of the ultimate reality. The ultimate reality of the one who is sovereign and reigning over all calling them by name, knowing every detail of their story, pursuing them with your love. Oh, Father, I pray that all of these students would go back into whatever it is, their their normal routine, and they would look up with a new vision, with a new focus, with a new perspective because of what you, Lord Jesus, have done. Father, for the church here today, I pray that you would give us the faith to look up and then to walk wherever you lead. Give us the faith to follow you. And Father, for those who are among us, perhaps some of the students even that have been a part of this whole weekend or or some who are with us here today in this service or, or, or joining online, that realize right now They are one of those people that actually is without hope. They are one of those people that actually has been consumed with the things of this world, overwhelmed and afraid. I pray, Lord God, that today would be the day that they would look up and say, Jesus, I need you. I am ready to follow you in faith. I trust my life to you, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Thank you for what you have done. We praise your name. We praise your name. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with us. We're going to sing together as we close our time this morning. And I just want you to know, church, we do this every week as we sing at the end of a service. We've got some of our ministry team that will be down front here. We would love to pray with you. If you know you need someone to pray over you, please come during the song or come at the end of the service. We'd love to pray with you, whatever needs you may have. 
And if you're here today and you realize you need to begin a relationship with Jesus, we, we say that is the most important decision that anyone could ever make. If you're here today and know you need to begin a relationship with Jesus, we invite you to come down front as we sing or come at the end of the service. Our ministry team is here to pray with you and lead you in that most important decision. Let's lift our voices in gratitude for what God has laid before us in his word.